King. We magnify you. We magnify you. We magnify you, great King. Jesus. Jesus. The word they've been crying out for in Spanish, fuego, fire. When you hear the blast of the shofar, I want you to raise your voices in a shout to God. Jesus. Lord, this is your day. Your will be done in power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remain standing. Let me introduce to you Brother David Hogan, who's been on the front lines for years now, planting churches, driving out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, glorifying Jesus. Let's welcome him. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Y'all doing all right? Sounds like it. Here's what we're going to do. I really appreciate you uh, honoring uh, God in me and all of that, but I really want to give it to Jesus. Is that all right? Yeah! Jesus, we are zeros, but with him, there's nothing we can't do, nothing. All righty, let's have a seat, please. Grab your Bibles, please. <clears throat> so all of y'all think y'all want to take the world for Jesus, don't you? I've been out there battling for a little while. Hello, Brother Kava, how you doing? Me too. I've been out there a few years. I am a pastor's son. Uh, my daddy was, in my opinion, one of the best men of God I've ever met. Southern Baptist pastor. Good guy. There was one thing he had on his heart his whole life. My whole life I was taught one thing. One thing. Win souls for Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. You're good for nothing if you can't do that. How about that? Okay. <clears throat> I have to apologize to you for a few things. I don't have a real fancy vocabulary. <laughs> I wear cowboy boots. <laughs> and 
and I'm not going to wear a tie, so don't get mad at me. Okay, that's all the apologies you get. Okay. I hate hypocrisy. Hypocrites deserve the hell they're going to get. Don't ever lie to anybody. I was a little Baptist boy that grew up innocent and was destroyed at first by hypocrites. Religious demons tried to eat my lunch, and they did for a while. But then Jesus came. <laughs> and uh, I'm really glad to be here. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. <laughs> Yahoo! <laughs> something to say and uh, see what what the problem is it's really simple really it's not complicated I've worked real hard for lots of years now 22 years I've worked hard in the jungle been shot beat stoned everything you can find that our brother Paul went through, except I haven't been shipwrecked in the deep. I've only had my trucks washed out from under me by rivers. These fellows that are with me, would y'all all stand up, please, you guys that are running with me? Miss Judy, you too, please. <laughs> I don't know if y'all know anything about covenant, but you will be taught that. I know that man over there, so... But we have a covenant together, me and those fellows y'all just saw. We own each other's blood, and Jesus owns our blood too. And that's something. And I suggest that you learn how to become covenant people with each other and with ministry that God's calling you to do. Because you have one answer, and that's die for souls. If you're not a martyr, you're nothing. Now, that's my opinion, because I am a martyr. You're looking at a man that is dead for another people. Time will prove me right. And when I stand before Jesus, here's what he's going to tell me, okay? Well done. <laughs> that's what he's going to say. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That's the only thing valuable that's all that matters is that everything you do, every breath you take, every step you take is because you're headed to that great white throne and you want one phrase coming from the king. Well done. <laughs> I like that. Feels good to me. And I'm going to have it. You may have another agenda. That's your business. <laughs> I don't. It's to bring these engines I work for. <laughs> we're going to walk up there, see? All of us. And we're going to bow to our king, and he's going to say, you boys did good. Come on in here. It may not be as pretty as you can do, but you better look around because we're going to be there. Okay? We work with Indians. Several tribes, I think it's somewhere between 18, 20 different tribes of people we're working with now. 
I'm known or our ministry is known for something. <laughs> We're ultra committed, committalist. If I give my word to an Indian, the only thing, shh, the only thing that means I won't be there is because I'm dead. Because I speak for the king. I am an ambassador for Jesus. You understand how important what you say and what you do is to other people? And so I want you to understand that, like I said, I grew up in a, in a, in a I was a pastor's son, an awesome time for me. It was good. <clears throat> Let's see what we're going to do here. Go, to, go with me. We're going to start this. I'm going to try to get something going here that... Go with me into Matthew chapter 21, please. I certainly hope I'm right. Jesus. I am married and have four children. My first grandbaby will be born this week. <laughs> that's fun. It's fun that I'm going to be in Europe. That's what's fun. God spoke to us a long time ago to go out and work with these people in the, in the places where uh, other people have failed to see the need or the value of the souls that are out there. Uh, not taking away from anything anybody else is doing. That's not my goal for being here. It's not my goal for being here to lift us up either. My goal is to lift up Jesus, to motivate you, to go for souls regardless of the cost. That's my reason for being here. Nothing else matters to me. Uh, these people are nations of people. They're out there. <clears throat> They'll tell you that I can quote you nations. I can quote out of books of people that say that these nations where we work are already evangelized. They're liars. There's thousands of villages. Thousands. They have never heard the name of Jesus. That is sin. <laughs> the great fire of heaven is on the earth, and there's thousands of villages that have never heard the gospel. That's sin. And we're going to get them. <laughs> you might not. I've been down there for almost 25 years, and I haven't ever seen you there yet. And I'm diligent about going out every day to at least one, most of the time two, sometimes three villages and preach. I've never seen you out there. It's amazing. <clears throat> we'll see. All right. Let's do it like this. I was a brand new Christian Real zealous for the demon at first. I was a gang member. Jesus come and touched me and brought me back. And so I was real zealous for God with the same commitment I was zealous for the devil with. And it hadn't fell off of me yet. There was people who told me when I first got going because I was burning... The fires were so bright in my heart, they told me, you can't go this, you can't go the distance with that big of a fire. They were telling me, you've got to calm down a little bit to be able to make the distance. That is not scriptural. That is religion. That is a devil trying to talk you out of the precious holy fire of God that's burning in your heart. And so, don't listen to them. Don't hate them. Just smile at them and keep walking. Because they're wrong. Because here we are a quarter of a century later, and we've got more fire now than we've ever had. <laughs> uh, but I had a problem. It wasn't that I wasn't zealous. It wasn't that I didn't, I knew a little bit of the Bible. It wasn't that I didn't have a place to preach. The problem was, this great Jesus that we all know exists, 
Where is his power? I think that's still a valid question for most people. Um, I can feel his presence regularly. I can, uh, I, there are certain songs I can start singing, Holy and Anointed One. That song starts singing. I immediately become a, a tear. It just eats me alive inside because he's so awesome. But where is the power of God? Where is it? Well, I found it. I sure did. It's alive, and it's not some fairy tale or hoax. It's not some illusion that escapes us continually. It's real. <laughs> and I want you to have it. And you know what else? Hey. <laughs> Jesus wants you to have it. So have it. <laughs> Fuego del Espíritu Santo cae en ese lugar en esos momentos, Padre mío. Hallelujah. So I went out there, see, no training, no Bible school like you're getting the great privilege to go through. I didn't get to hear any great people talk. I didn't know anybody. I was a Southern Baptist boy that got filled with the Holy Ghost, lit up on fire for God and just cast out by the charismatic renewal out into the jungle. <laughs> Woof. Looked like a ball of fire running through the sky. It just landed out there and it started just burning up the jungle. It really did. I didn't know what I was doing. We're just now learning. But I did know that I didn't have... See, you, see, look, I was in a church service on an Indian, in another man's, in another work. I was invited there. I, didn't, I hadn't made it all the way through language school yet. And I was, in, I was in there, and I couldn't understand Spanish yet, just a few words. And, and there's probably 400 Indians standing around. The Holy Ghost is everywhere. And they brought this little girl up to me, four years old, and they set her down. I didn't know what was wrong with her. I'm making sign language. I, uh, I'm trying to get God to give me a supernatural revelation of the language. I'm trying to have faith and be there. I'm trying to do it regardless of my shortcomings and failures. I was there anyway. And, and so this old Indian, who I admire greatly in my life, one of the greater men I've ever met, he says, that's pretty simple. She can't hear. And it turns out she was born deaf from birth. And uh, so I knelt down there. And I just, I mean, I had watched the power of God. This is in 1977. I watched the power of God fall into place and knock everybody down. I watched people wailing and moaning and and I, was, and I had nothing to do with it. I was just happened to be there. Jesus just came, and, and I was amazed at what was going on. I, benches and benches of people were falling and wailing and moaning and, and, and carrying on, and I'd never seen it before. And I'm a little Baptist guy, I remember. And so, and I'm sitting there, and I'm watching, and they, and, 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 but it didn't matter to me. I'm not into manifestations. I'm into Jesus. I, you manifest ever how you want to. It's not going to impress me. I, I want Jesus. And so I'm, I'm holding on to this little girl. I'm down on the floor, and I, just, I had seen other things already get healed, and I was impressed with Jesus. And I, just, I had more, my heart was almost to burst with, it was going to burst, I tell you. I just knew it was going to happen. And I just knew I was fixing to run off that mountain like a madman, screaming and hollering and glorifying the king. And I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and it did not happen. That impressed me. That much of Jesus and what I could see and what I could feel and what I knew, the little, the little nuggets that I did have in me and the, the things that I saw, I, that bothered me. It irritated me pretty bad inside because she's four years old. She's not to blame. Okay, then let's lay blame. Is it God's fault? Is it that little baby's fault? Then whose fault is it? 
wrong. He cannot stop the power of God. Do not give the enemy of my king that much credit. He has no right to stop the king. I accept the responsibility. I am the doorway that is blocked. I am the log jam. I am the problem. It's not Jesus, and the devil cannot stop my king. I've seen it too much now. You can't talk me into it. Don't try. I will just laugh at you because of your lack of experience. <laughs> We're going to have a good time this week, huh? <laughs> Listen to me. I was weeping. I was complaining. I was screaming. I was commanding. I was jumping. I was ripping. I was tearing. And she stayed deaf. All right. So here's what happened. I am humiliated now. All of the great wonders of God flying all around me and this baby, this that I wanted healed so bad, is still deaf. Oh, I don't like that. That's a devil to me. I ain't living with that. Something's got to give. So I got to find the point that's the hardest and crush it so that it will give. So as I'm standing there, I was on my knees weeping and holding this child. I called out to heaven, please, could you help me just a little bit? And he did. He, there was a vision. I haven't had a whole lot of them, just a few, probably four, maybe five open, open visions to where you're looking like it's a movie, and I was there. And what happened was there was this awesome pasture, Brother Mike. It was beautiful, lush, and green, and awesome, and full of nutrients, and the right things were there. And there was this huge beast, a big bull that was all powerful, that was me. And I mean blowing and ripping the ground and eating the right nutrients and, 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 and it was I mean the power was definitely there. I mean it, and I was tearing that field that bull was tearing that field up in the horns and and then all of a sudden in the middle of this huge beautiful pasture there was a little present sit there by the Holy Ghost. And this huge, powerful bull walks up to that present, and with all of his power and might and all of his great ability, he could not open that present. And the next moment, there was a baby, probably 10 or 11 months old, maybe 15 months at the most, sitting in front of that present and with the greatest of ease was just enjoying itself opening that little package. And that big bull was tearing the ground up, had all power, eating the great nutrients, but it was the baby that got into the box, not the big bull. And I said to Jesus, either make me that baby or I ain't going to preach. And he said, you must become as a little child to enter the kingdom of God. It's not the manifest. It's not the great power you possess. It's not your great abilities. It's becoming as a child and walking in the gifts of heaven. That's what it is. That's it. And so I've been working on that ever since. All right. That's one thing that happened. Oh, the little baby girl never did get healed. My fault. I stand before heaven responsible because I'm not a person that will give it to you. I'll take the responsibility and I will fall on the mercy of God with it. Okay? And so, went from there to uh, I began to seek after heaven. And so, like I said, I am not a man of Fancy words. But my heart is so 
thirsty. I, I, I want Jesus. I want his great gifts. All of them. I will not be behind in any gift. Period. I have the right to ask. I am a son and not a bastard. I have the right to my daddy's reserves. And so, I went to him. And I went in that Bible, okay? This is what I did. I went to that Bible right there, and I began to figure it out. I took from Genesis straight through to Revelation all the prayers in the Bible. I took them all. And I studied every one of them, took them apart, took them, dissected them, turned them every way, put all the books into it. I wanted to know how come when those boys spoke, their words did not fall to the ground. So then I took fasting because the two things that move heaven is prayer and fasting. If you can submit your soul in prayer and your body in fasting, God hears me. And so I <clears throat> went there. And so what I did is I looked through the Bible and, and y y this is my opinion, what I'm fixing to tell you next. And in my opinion, the hardest thing I could come up with the most difficult thing I could find in the Bible for God to do was once a human being is dead to bring them back to life again. So I decided that through the old covenant and the new, that was the thread of, of God's power that was in both covenants. And so I decided that I was going to seek heaven until the day came that I could walk up to a dead person and touch him and watch him fly up from the dead. That's what I decided to do. I decided it doesn't make any difference if I have to fast until I turn into a bone, I don't care. If I have to pray 24 hours a day, I have to have the great glory of God that it takes to change the world around me in my generation. <laughs> I'm going to have it. So that's what I did. I went after that. I was called to lots of different things from people around me. I was immature. I was too young. I didn't understand. I, I was too zealous. I was over zealous. I was under zealous. I was called everything. But it didn't stop. Once I figured out that from Genesis to Revelation there was a common flow through all the prophets, apostles, men of God, they all went at God from the same direction. You cannot get him any other way. When I decided that was right, that's what I did. And I still do. And so began the ordeal of year after year after year of prayer and fast and diligence. Hours and hours and hours a day fasting and praying and seeking heaven and reading and studying and meditating the scripture thousands of hours of going out riding in a four-wheel drive in a bumpy old road and beating up, tearing up vehicles and motorcycles and horses and myself and people around me, all of us getting hurt and getting over it. And, but I would not be satisfied until I, with my hand, could see something that could not be faked. How do I know you even had a headache before they started praying for you? Anyway. So I went after heaven. And the response was wonderful. Right here in Matthew 21. There's a few things here that we're going to be talking about in the next few days. You're probably going to get tired of hearing it because I'm going to say it over and over and over and over and over and over to you. <clears throat> it says right here in verse 17, And he left them and went out of the city to, into Bethany, and, and he lodged there. And now in the morning time, he returned to the city. What does it say about him? He hungered. The man was like me. He gets hungry. Sometimes he wants a double hamburger with bacon on it sometimes. But it says right here, he went and saw a fig tree in the way and he found no fruit on it. 
found nothing there but leaves only. Could I give you some advice? <laughs> we are trees. Most of us, I know that I am a grafted in tree. And I'm grafted into the orchard of God, the vineyard of heaven. And, and, and do I have the right, when the king comes to me, to not have fruit on it? Do I have the right? Is there an excuse good enough? I haven't, it's, I haven't been in the season, Lord. It's not season, Lord. He's the king. And when he comes wanting fruit... Who are we not to give it to him? Who do we think we are? <laughs> I, know, I, I know this. It doesn't matter how deep the mud, it doesn't matter how much it rains, it doesn't matter how hot it is, it doesn't matter what kind of food it is. None of that is important. I, I, one of the problems I have, if you think you're going to come to our work, let me just tell you ahead of time. I don't see the distance between A and B, I see when people are raised from the dead and born again. I don't see the difficulties. I don't understand people that do. And I don't want to. I see people that don't have Jesus. And whatever it takes me to get there, doesn't matter. The amount of money, immaterial. The amount of Things that have to be expended so that one person can be born again doesn't matter. What matters is they go with me and Jesus tells us, well done. That's what matters. Okay? And so I'm not understood because I don't understand. I don't understand when people's flesh need this. When I know that soul is going to burn in hell if I don't get there and my flesh is crying, so what? They need the fire of heaven on them. <laughs> they need zeal in them. They need compassion. <laughs> and I have those things. And for me not to get it to them is sin. I've been equipped with fruit that the world needs. Who am I when the king says, give it? I don't give it because of some immaterial little bump like bullets or machetes or something. When the king comes, uh, I don't want this. I don't want him to tell me no fruit grow on you henceforth. I don't want to wither up and dry and become a has-been, a person that could have borne fruit. I, I don't want to be, well, you know, he used to be a good tree. The Bible says in verse 21, I don't care what kind of translation you have, but it's going to say something similar to what mine does. It says, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith, See, that's what we're talking about here, isn't it? Amen. Isn't that the whole thing? Not long ago, my son went out. My son is now 25 years old, and he works with us. He's been through school and all that, and he works with us. He's a good boy. He went out to church with my son-in-law. My daughter got married, and my son-in-law, they work with us also. I train my kids to preach the gospel. There's nothing else out there of value. And if God decides they're going to do something else, then he'll have to train them because I'm training them to preach. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have to go to school and do something else because they're going to all be able to preach because that's, that's God. Okay. There's my whole family value thing right there. All right, now. And I am the boss, too, by the way. And so, in my house. So, he went to church because it was God for him to go to church. The place was volatile around us. There was some uh, terrorist insurgents around. <laughs> Let's say it like that. Real nice. Real, real politically correct. Devils. They're devils. 
All of them. And so, <clears throat> anybody can rape a woman, and anybody can take a little baby by the feet and bust their head on an oak tree. You're not macho. You're a devil if you do that. There it is. Okay. Now you know another doctrine we have. Hate devils. <laughs> oh, boy. Yes, he does. And so uh, he goes to church, normal day, you know, bright, sunshiny, kind of like what we have here, just except a little bit hotter. And it was really nice. Uh, we use these things called, y'all familiar with a mo motorcycle called the XR600R? Anybody? Really nice motorcycles. We use them. We go up in the mountains. Also, we use these things called a uh, uh, one-ton four-wheel drive forward. They don't make anything else, I don't think, but maybe one day they will. <laughs> and so <laughs> we're driving along, and uh, <laughs> he goes to church. My son-in-law went on a motorcycle, and my son went in his four-wheel drive, and they went to two different churches, and but only one thing happened. The town I live in is really volatile most of the time. It's a, it's a cabecera. It's a, what is a cabecera, somebody? County seat. County seat. It's a headquarters of, uh, of many, many demons. I was asked by several missionaries, why are you moving into that town? Well, there's devils there. That's why I moved there. There's a lot prettier towns. There's lots of towns that have a lot less devils. Well, what you say, let's go where the devil lives. And let's set up the kingdom of God. And let's take it from him. How's that sound? Seems to me like we're supposed to be violent and take it by force or something like that, it seems like. <laughs> now, Lord. So anyway, these, uh, these demons took over the town I live in. The only one thing wrong with it was my daughter-in-law was inside. So they had this whole town cut off. It's a big town. And so they, 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 there was a lot of bloodshed and going on a war happening. And my son and my son-in-law are out doing the will of God. They're preaching the gospel. And my daughter-in-law is in my house there uh, uh, alone, except for our 135-pound Rottweiler named Jake. I wouldn't suggest you messing with Jake. He's like me. He don't tolerate very much. So anyway, he didn't at the time. So I get a phone call. I was in another place, 2.30 in the morning. My daughter-in-law is a little bit nervous. She had reason to be. Bullets are flying all around, and my son is gone, and she's talking to him on the radio, and the Army's, all got, the, Army's got them, and the other, there's two lines, right? So he stopped outside, and so people ask me all the time, what do you do living in that town? Another question I get asked, what do you do sending your children into places you know is volatile? Well, like I told you before, I don't see the volatile. I see souls. And when Jesus comes, he's going to find fruit on us. If I submit to volatile, if I submit to fear, doubt, unbelief, deception, if I sit, submit to lies of the devil, I will not be fruitful. I will be defeated. That's what I will be eventually. So it says right here in my Bible, let me read it to you in verse 22. Can I do that? Is that all right? And I'd like to know if y'all's phrase is similar to what mine is in the first three words. It says, all things. Does y'all say something similar to that? Does that exempt volatile situations where your children are involved? Does that, does that exempt situations where, where people you love have, have been attacked aggressively by a demon spirit? Uh, some principalities grabbed a hold of... Uh, even though you're praying and fasting, you're seeking God, and one slips in the, through the ranks and grabs a hold, and one of your darling children are laying, dying of some unknown disease. <laughs> Does it mean everything except when, you're, when your finances have run out? When your friends have deserted you? 
What does that mean? It must mean something else. Because the army I'm in is not as big as you think it is. We get called all kind of things. Man, y'all are an elite group. Y'all are, man, y'all are wild. Y'all are this, y'all are that. I don't agree with that. We're normal. And we hate the devil. And it doesn't make any difference what the thing is. It submits. Whatever its name is, it seems like my Bible says in Philippians somewhere that all things, whether in the heavens or in the earth or under the earth, will bow to the name of Jesus. Is that true or not? Is that what y'all's Bible says? Mine says that. <laughs> I'm a militant. You're right. And I hate the devil and I despise bowing to him. I won't. I won't. It's not even part of, the, part, of, part of the equation. All things comma. There's another word. Whatsoever. You ask when? Prayer. What's going to happen? You're going to believe. And then what's going to happen? You will receive. That's the end of it. Okay? I have to tell you that because I'm going to start telling you some stuff now that's going to freak you out. Because my son, my daughter-in-law told me, what do you want us to do? All right. I told my daughter-in-law, you go to bed. Is there not a moment where Jesus was in a ship? Seems like it's either Mark 3 or Mark 4, somewhere along those lines. And there was a great storm. All the apostles, what were they? Frustrated, fearful, wondering, in amazement of the storm. Where was Jesus? He was asleep on the pillow. Okay, somebody's wrong. Who is it? It's not Jesus. It ain't God. See, that gets me frustrated. <laughs> See, look, look, here's the problem. I told my daughter-in-law, lay down, put you a little bed out right by that radio so you can hear Jody, and you go to bed. She didn't grow up in my home. She's a foreigner. I'm serious. She didn't have the same values that I teach my people and, and all of that. They, they didn't go through the same stress and through the same mold and through the, all the things we've been through and the things I've taught my children. She wasn't taught that. But she said to me these exact words. Okay. Smart girl. <laughs> She's a blessing. And so my big old dog, Jake, he, I wasn't there. But what he did, he circled that house a few times. She laid a pallet down there. He went right outside the window and laid down. It wasn't his normal place to lay. She told me that through the night, every now and then, he'd just get up and make a, you could hear this walking around the house, just checking on things for me, you know. He knew. How do he know? Don't know. Jesus. Jesus, talk to your dog. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what else he talks to? My horse. Tell the horse to not listen. It ain't my fault. But they know. Them animals know. They're good friends. And so, in the morning, no word from Jody still, and I told her, this is what I told her, by X time, if, if there's no word, I will be there, and I will get you out. <laughs> How's that possible? 
because there's something inside of me called the Holy Ghost. And I wouldn't suggest you messing with him. Because what if he does come on me? See, I don't live in the what if he don't or maybe I'm, maybe I'm in presumption. No, no, I'm not in presumption. It's God to go get my daughter-in-law out of that problem. Everything in between is immaterial. I've already told you that. That's not even, we don't look at that. You look at Jesus, you get the problem fixed and that's it. So Jesus, knowing that I will do that, he did intervene for me because a few minutes before the time for us to intervene in a different way, he... Somehow there was an opening. I don't understand all the things he does, but there was an opening in the lines, and my son went through and got to his wife, and everything's fine. And that's something. They were all delivered, and it's wonderful. Now, where do you get, how do you get, how is it possible to call on a God you cannot see just every now and then we can feel his presence. Thanks be to God forevermore. How is it possible to call on a being that you've never seen? Most of us haven't. And him respond. Because it says in my Bible right here. Let me read it to you one more time. Y'all are not getting this yet. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believe, and you can receive it. You can have it. It's yours. Because you see, it says right in, right, right in my... See, I went to heaven for four and a half years to touch a dead person. I was around a lot of dead people. But because where I live, it's not the same as where you live. When, when around where you live... You call the coroner, he comes, verifies the death. You never see the body again until it's the, uh, the casket. Then y'all then go and put them in the ground, and that's the end of that. There's embalming, there's all sorts of things. It could be several days. Da, da, da. It's not that way where we are. The family takes care of the body. Every family takes care of their own dead. And so you get a lot of opportunities to touch people that are dead. Our work is real large. There's thousands of people born again. It's wonderful and all that. And... I really want to come, come after you today on purpose this way with serious aggression so you'll understand that we're really real about what I'm telling you. Because what I'm going to tell you on, on down in here, you have to understand that it didn't come just because I sat down one day and decided, okay, heaven, here I am, now it's time to go. Let's go for it. We sought the Lord, and he heard our cry. And we continually seek the Lord, and he continually hears our cry. Go to Mark chapter 3, okay? Is that all right? I can't give you a one, two, three explanation on how to get all this stuff. I can just show you what the Bible says, and it's up to you to take it. Because it works. What it says in that book, it's for me now. You can defuse it. You can dilute it. You can do anything you want to with it. That's your privilege. But when he's talking in that book, he's talking to me. And it's for right now. Okay? And then right here in Mark 3, it, uh, somewhere around verse 13, I guess we'll start. Because you see that I went days and days and months and weeks and years seeking heaven. Diligent. Y'all know what that word means? It's a new word that's put into the English vocabulary. Jesus dropped it into the universe here lately. Diligence. It came the same time faithfulness did. It came the same time discipline did. Most Americans, 
don't understand any of those terms. It came with responsibility. And until you get those things in you, and they come through time with Jesus. Sincerity. You got to have it. <laughs> Loyalty. Commitment. But everything I tell you, I'm a lifer. Do y'all know what that means? I'm not a short-term, fly-by-night, looking for any kind of other ministry. That's not, I, that's not me at all. Those Indians are my home. I intend to stay there till I die, and I'm happy with that. All it took Jesus to do to get me there was a lot. And I'm going to stay there now. You understand that? Do you understand I am a person of destiny and purpose? I've been chosen, handpicked by royalty for a job. Trained and possessed by the great king to complete what I've been called to do. Nothing else matters. <laughs> I can't see it. Don't you get it? I can't see anything else. <laughs> and the reason I can't is because of what I'm fixing to read to you right here. Because the first time, I must tell you this first, I can't tell you success, I must tell you failure first. My greatest successes have come out of my deepest failure. <laughs> Nobody likes that kind of preaching. Monsoon, do y'all know what that word means? I understand y'all had some of that last year when them hurricanes come right up y'all's nose here the other day, a few months ago. I realized, I was watching that, I said, whoo, see how committed they are now? <laughs> a little bit of rain tests everybody's fortitude. <laughs> yep. Monsoons came. I was fresh in Mexico. I didn't have any work at all. Had a lot of time off. When you don't have any work, you got lots of free time. And I'm not the kind of a person that enjoys that much free time. I like to be busy, busy, busy. And it makes you real bored and gives you too much energy. And you usually make mistakes, I do. So, so I stay busy to keep that energy level down a little bit. And so I had this little group of young people I was messing with out there, little street people, just probably 25 of them, you know. Uh, a lot of them didn't have daddies, and so I was just teaching them Jesus. Yes, Jesus, 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 taking them fishing, taking them out to the river, messing with them. Go out and uh, just messing around with them, just doing stuff. They had never done it before, so I was just messing with them. Monsoons came. It was my first year to mess with monsoons. I didn't understand monsoons very well. I got a good understanding now. And so, uh, there's a tap on my gate. I go out there to find one of those young men there, uh, Mr. David, because uh, uh, I'm a pretty good athlete and I'm an excellent swimmer. So they said, look, you need to get your flippers. And one of the fellows that was in our little group fell in the river. The monsoon river, swell, they swell up pretty fast and they're real treacherous and very bad. And he was in there. He's been in there an hour now. Would you please come help? So I grabbed my flippers, run down to the edge of the river. and I stripped down and jumped in there, put my flippers on, dove right in. Poof, muddy, murky, scary water. It's called a remolino. It was flowing backwards from the current of the river, and it was a big, uh, what is it, a remolino? Whirlpool. There was four of us in the water. And we were looking, they were sure that boy was down in there somewhere. And we would, every time I'd come up for air, there was over a thousand people on the bank. 
And they were screaming orders to us. I learned a lots of lessons in all of this stuff through the years. Don't tell me where to go unless you're going to get in the water with me. That's another thing you don't do to guys like me. You're going to get in that water with me, and you're going to suffer, and you're going to understand, and you're going to let it beat on you. I'll listen to you. But you're going to stay on the bank, and you're going to know everything, and we don't know nothing, but the little bit we know, we're trying, and you're not. Shut up. I mean that in a good sort of way. <laughs> so we're in there, and sure enough, it, that tangled up in those willows. Y'all know what willow trees are? It's a tree that it got big old long skinny limbs and when it's covered in water, there are tentacles. You go by, it just wraps you up and won't let you go and it's scary, especially when it's black under there. That thing grabbed hold of me and I was able to, thank you Jesus, break all those limbs and get away. Marked me up a little bit, that's okay. Because all of a sudden reaching out and trying to get away, I touched the body. Broke him loose, brought him up, okay. Little boat, put him up in the boat, and us fellows, we got him in there, and we was talking about what to do with him, and so we decided to go ahead and just take him on out, and uh, so we did, and all these people are on the bank trying to tell us all these things. Now, we got him out, laid him on the thing, and right in the middle of all that mass confusion, the mother was screaming, and the daddy was wailing, and the family, and it was, it was, it was rough, it was rough. I don't like being around it, but yeah. But you have to sometimes. So we laid that boy down there. Right in the middle of all of that, Jesus spoke to me to pray for him. I will raise him from the dead. You're right. It was an awesome moment. But I disobeyed. Oops. How did it go? Uh oh. <laughs> and I'm standing there and I'm watching all of this confusion and all this hurt and pain. And do you understand what at that moment I am for the kingdom of God? I am a doorway of power. But because of what I'm looking at right here, faces of men, fear gripped me at the same time that faith did. Doubt and unbelief. My king was asking for fruit. And you want me to show you what I did? I was bent over him like this. I walked off. Oh, that's a bad feeling. I wouldn't suggest you doing that either. It don't go very well with you in a few minutes. I can still feel the hurt and the emotions of the moment because I disobeyed God Almighty. Uh, listen to this. Listen to this. I live with this every day, okay? I condemned that 14-year-old boy to eternal damnation. He was not born again. Uh-oh. <laughs> <clears throat> And uh, so by the time I made it home, the demon that was riding my back had made his job pretty complete. I was useless. I began to blubber and to uh, go into confusion and doubt and, and condemnation was huge and all sorts of other demons and deception had settled in and the cloud that I could not see through and could not sort out the emotions of and the had gotten a hold of my spirit and had, because I had submitted to it, because of one thing, the fear of man. You can take your intimidation and go back to hell you came out of with it. Not anymore for me. No, sir. No, sir. I won't eat that no more. It's a bad and sour pill. It's not for me. That's why I seem aggressive to you. That's why I seem like, my God, this fella is overpowering. He, he, he's intimidating. 
uh, I, I won't allow certain things that have eaten my lunch in the past to even get at the table. <laughs> You're not even allowed to sit up with me. You can go to hell. Right now is fine. Yahoo. <laughs> and I mean it. <laughs> oh, I can feel aggression on me. Well, can you feel it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Man. And so uh, what happened was um, I went through about a month of the most miserable days of my life. And finally, thanks be to God for a good woman. My wife is real tiny, but she's really feisty. <laughs> she's a good lady. <laughs> she comes marching in there. She grabbed me by the collar. And she said, now then, listen to me. I didn't want to. I was rolling in the mire of it. I didn't want to hear her. I didn't want to hear anybody. She said, this is what you're going to do. This was not a choice. I didn't have, I wasn't the king anymore. She said, you will either Get out there and win souls like Jesus told you to do and you will let the devil fall off of you and you will forgive yourself and you will let God forgive you or let's go home. That was God talking to me. And she was the only one with the guts enough to tell me. And I looked at her and I said, okay. So I got up and got a few tracks and <laughs> I went out there and fired up that old 454 positive traction, 456 gears, tuned headers, tuned carburetors, Fired up that big old four-wheel drive and went out into a village and come back, and I was a little bit better. And the next day, she helped me to get in the truck again, <laughs> and I was a little bit better until finally, after a while, probably another month, I was running it full steam again. But now I have the most valuable lesson of all under my belt. I am a failure without obedience to the name of Jesus. <laughs> Yahoo! That makes me powerful because I know what the bowels of failure and hell are all about. Total destruction for the human body and soul. Total annihilation of what little ministry there is. You must realize Jesus is your source. Jesus is your mainstay. Without him, you're nothing, but with him, you can do anything. And it wasn't but just a few months after that. I was doing good. I had opened up, gone into a, a, a valley. Nobody from anywhere had ever, ever stood there and said in this valley, Jesus is Lord. Ooh, that's fun. That's fun. That's fun. My job is fun. Yes, the hordes of hell are relentless. Yes, the diseases, you've never heard of them. They're the tormenting spirits, the lies. That is, ooh, ooh, uh, ooh. That's rough. But you know what? What's this? You go in there. Listen to me, okay? These principalities, do they know what that is? <laughs> well, you never know. I'm in America. So, ooh, chop, chop.
principalities, you know, governing spirits, demons, uh, governments that are set up that you, most people don't believe they exist anyway, but they're there. Now, now understand that there's this fellow named Adam one time, way back a long time ago. See? He made a big mistake. He made a big mistake. He was a traitor. And so when he, when he betrayed us, or the kingdom of God, the unleashing of demon hordes on this planet, and they set up and they, met, they took over areas and territories and set up all these camps and rulings, and, uh, and they defended violently against the kingdom of God. All right, get this, you ready? From the day he was in high treason against heaven until the day you walk in to one of these villages or territories, there's never been anybody contest them. I am an ambassador from heaven. I have the right to walk into these territories that have never heard this. Jesus is Lord, and I proclaim it, I decree it. Okay? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and so, you're standing there, right? And you proclaim Jesus is Lord. And when you do that, all of the authority of heaven comes to bear on the authorities of hell. And there's an amazing eruption takes place. <laughs> In its instant, demons, well, I don't know how much of this we can talk about, but uh, I'm not moved by that. I'll see. And so, They come on you, they come after you. Well, see, but, but you, you, when light hits a place, darkness flees from it. And, and God, God allows me to have these energies and these angels that have been assigned to us, they really do, they look at heaven and go. Because the Bible says they dare to, to, to go where we go. They're, they're, but they have to go. And there's another fellow that runs around with me. He's big. His name is Jesus. And he's right there. And he is my friend. It says in, I think it's John chapter 15, I think it's where it's at, that he says, I no longer call you a servant, but a friend. Wow. That's important people. I'm a friend of Jesus. You understand? And so if Jesus is my friend, then why do I worry about this big prince that's standing there that's from the devil? Because my friend said it was okay. So then you, bud, back out. Because he happens to be the king of the universe and you happen to be a loser. So, So you're in this village, it's called Tlatlapango. And there you are, you fancy four-wheel drive. There ain't no electricity, no running water. You get out, you're happy to be there, the smell of the jungle, the heat instantly grabs you because your air conditioner's off now. And you walk out there, and this little Indian runs up to you. A little bitty Indian fellow about that big. Comes running up there, taps you on the... Brother David, see. Mi hijo está para morir. My son is about to die. I said, well, look, I've got to go first preach the gospel. And then after I preach, I will go and lay hands on the sick. Does y'all's Bible say something like this in Psalms 107? It says, uh, 
God sent his word to heal. Did y'all's Bible say that? Okay. Somewhere around verse 19 or 20. And so uh, the word has to go forth first. That's just my opinion, okay? It ain't always that way, but this time it was. So, so I went with him. We went to church. Cranked up my little Coleman lantern. I mean, you got to get this. Got a grass roof, dirt floor, brand new fledgling church. I mean, you, the, the, you're, you're winning. You got a few converts here. You got a couple of people that in an area that for who knows how many millenniums, but the demon has controlled it. And, and now there is a gospel light there with the ability to take over everything it touches. See? The oppression and the pressures, oh, they're very real and they don't feel good, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't stop the power of God. You get it? So after church, it was good. I, it was wonderful. A little service and putting up my little light. I'd done my thing. I'd done what I'm called to do. I went out there. I preached the gospel. Woo! That's what I'm supposed to do. And a man, he sat right beside me on the bench. I got up. The only difference was I got up and preached, and he listened. Now he says to me, Brother David, you got to come pray for my son. I said, okay. So I take off through the jungle. It's got my little backpack. I mean, that scene is awesome. I'm the only American within, I don't know how many hundred miles. There ain't no telling. And I'm in this jungle scene. I mean, the trees are humongoid, and the, everything's awesome. The smells of the jungle. I mean, it's just wonderful to me. Houses are here and there. You can't hear, you can't see this village. You know, every now and then a dog will bark. That's the only way you can tell it's there. Black. Everything's black. It's like a cave almost under that canopy. And I'm walking through there, and this little light doesn't throw a whole lot of light. But I'm just thinking, God, this is awesome. This is what we're, darkness is all around us, and we got a little light here. This is God. The gospel is power. It helps people to see how to walk down the trail. It's wonderful. And I'm walking with these guys, and I'm, get closer and closer and I, we started up this mountainside and going by different houses and, and I heard this lady over there wailing Woo! I thought I wonder what that is man but the closer we get the louder it gets we're headed to the noise so I get over there close and the Indian brother walks up in his house it was his house he disappeared for a moment he comes back out. Now responsibility hits you. You ready? Because he got right up in my face. Little bit Indian fella. He said, my son is dead. Now you going to do something about it. Whoops. Is that so? So how many of y'all read the latest book on how to raise the dead? The eight one. <laughs> so, I mean, responsibility, severity, all those things, uh, scripture verses are running through my mind. Fear is gripping me again. Doubt, unbelief. Uh, this time, guess what I don't have this time? What's missing this time? What's missing this time is the direct commandment from Jesus to me, raise the dead. I didn't hear it this time. Uh-oh. Now things are complicated. Is it the will of God or not? <gasps> will it be his submissive or permissive? A perfect will of God. <gasps> Is the devil in him, on him, or around him? <gasps> Who cares? Throw him out. Sheesh. Okay, now we're going to get things a little bit more complicated, and I'm coming after some more of y'all's pet religious cliches. 
I go in this hut. The hut is small. They don't waste things there. I walked into there. I went bent down to go in the door. And when I walked in, the little house was made out of sticks. He went out in the jungle, cut him some sticks, trimmed them up, dried them, stood them up, wrapped them with uh, vehuco, vehuco. No. Vehuco. Vines. Who said that? How do you know that? Vines out of the jungle. Tied them all up. Went out there because on the one of the five days of the full moon, if you cut, there's a certain grass down there. If you cut it on the one of the five days of the full moon, <sighs> your roof will last, your thatch roof will last for 40 something years, a whole generation. But if you cut it on any of the days other than the f one of the five full days of the, of the full moon, it will rot in less than a year. Jesus. He does things to stuff. He's amazing. So I'm standing in this little house. The, the floor is made out of dirt. It's, he just... Okay, now I get inside there and there's two or three candles burning. The first thing I see is a woman in the middle of the floor holding on her knees, rocking back and forth, just screaming. Wah! And there's a little body stretched out. Her son, nine years old. Been dead now for four hours. I look right to her right and standing there, whoops, there's two black magic warlocks standing there. Standing right beside them are two spiritist healers. Wow. Okay, you got a couple of the elders of the town standing there, anti-Christ. They're against Jesus. You got the warlocks, you got the spiritists. Oh, ooh, whew, man, hmm. plenty of demons here. The sister, she was born again, this lady. When she looked up and saw me, because I was, I don't have to tell you how concerned I looked. I mean, you got a dead boy there. You got these warlocks there. You got these antichrists there. You got these spiritist healers there. It's time to be serious. <laughs> so what do you do? Pray. Believe, receive what? All things whatsoever. Is this true? Y'all understand it kind of how I think now? Is it getting there? Of course, it's the Bible, that's why. In uh, the different scriptures in the Old Testament and in the New begin to go through my mind of how these people had been raised from the dead, the different ones, and, and so I just didn't know what to do. I'd never read the book yet other than the Bible. And I've come to find out that's the only book. And so I literally did not know how to go about what I was doing. I did not have a direct word from God come into my spirit. I did not have an angelic visitation, manifestation. I did not have a finger on the wall. I didn't have even a bird peeping. I had two spiritist healers, two black magic warlocks, and two antichrists, and all of them were chanting evil spells on me. Now, if I was an American, and I thank God I am, but I'm not, uh, mentality has changed. That's what makes me different. Uh, I would think, well, the spiritual airways are not clean, so I can't pray. Praise the Lord. Hey. For us to wait on the spiritual airways to be clean, I would never pray. 
I'm working what's called pioneer work. There has never been anyone praying there before. So all the airways are contaminated by the demon forces. What do you think we have the Holy Ghost for? Let me just clue y'all into something that's very remarkable. There ain't a devil big enough to stop Jesus. That's really the truth, isn't it? The truth. Come on, come on, you preachers. Come on, preachers. Come on. Is it the truth? It really is the truth. Your emotions do not have anything to say about what you, what's going on. That don't you listen to your emotions, you'll always be in trouble. What the devil says, whether it's in your mind, your spirit, whether it's what you're seeing, feeling, tasting, touching, has nothing to do with what the Word of God says. What those warlocks are saying has nothing to do with the power of God. They cannot, can not, Stop heaven. Yahoo. <laughs> so I remembered what Jesus did. I figured, this is what, it, it, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a simple fellow, right? I'm sitting there, scriptures are running through my brains. I figured, Jesus probably did it right. Real easy. I'm going to show you. Here's how you do. Watch. Ready? Can't okay, never say you haven't been taught because I'm fixing to show you. Ready? This hand was on the little boy's head because the mama went into a whimper like a little animal backed over into the corner. And so the little boy's there, and I'm like this. Got my hands on his head, right? But I got big hands that usually covers pretty much distance. All right, so there. Then I decided I better see if he's only half dead. Maybe I can find a faint heartbeat. That surely would be easier. <laughs> so I looked all over that little boy for a heartbeat and a faint pulse and a this and a that. It weren't there. So I said, oh, well, he's all the way dead. <laughs> so I started praying. Now, the, usually when I start talking about this dead raising thing, there's all kind of questions. But I'm not going to give you the right to ask, so don't even think about it. Don't raise your hand. I'm not going to listen. Because the first question is always, how'd you pray? How long did you pray? What did you pray? What does it matter? The name of Jesus is what matters. The particular method I used, I was probably wrong. But there is this thing called grace and mercy. And it comes from heaven. And, and so you throw yourself on that all the time so as to Give him the glory, and everything will work out, usually. So I started praying for him. I prayed in English. That didn't work. So I prayed in Spanish. Uh-oh, that didn't work. So I prayed in Indian. Uh-oh, that didn't work. So I prayed in tongues. Uh-oh, that didn't work. I'm fresh out of languages. So now what do we do? <laughs> I told you, I can't give it or attribute it to anything but the name of Jesus. Okay, let's see if I can hold myself here because I feel the rise taking place. <laughs> it's Kind of taking me. Ooh. As I was sitting there, I began to 
I guess I was kind of frantically going from one to the other. I was probably using, you know, I would probably say a few syllables in one language and go to another. Just do, 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 going back and forth. But in every language, the name Jesus was what was prevalent. And that's what matters. How long? Don't have any idea. I know that I began to sweat pretty hard. And, uh, but it was kind of a hot night, around 100 degrees there at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I was praying and sweating and... And I was praying and sweating and holding on to the little boy's arm over here. It was stiff. He, he had gone stiff for me and got real sticky, lost all of his color. He was a lot whiter than I am and all that. And um, which usually they're almost black. And, and so all of a sudden, listen to this. This is pretty fun. I'm praying, right? And the little boy had on a little T-shirt. And I saw, me and the dad, when it, it bounced, it went. <gasps> and I went. <gasps> and I look up and the daddy was eyes as big as mine. Because he saw it too. But the devils are still chanting. <laughs> and they're still mad and they're still cursing God and me and everybody else. And. For some reason, it didn't bother the Holy Ghost. I just, what do you make of that? That mighty Holy Ghost came in there, thumped that heart on that little boy, kicked it all off again, and in just a few minutes, the little arm got limber. And the color, listen, listen to me. The color came back in, into him. He got warm again. Ooh, wow! Yeah. <laughs> see, see, all of y'all say, look, just calm down just a little. You are wrong about it. No, this is the wrong day to talk about that. Maybe tomorrow. Today's not the right day. Today is the same day of salvation as it was then, as it was when Jesus came back from the dead. Today is the day of power and resurrection. Today is the day of glory. Today is the day of visitation. <laughs> yeah. Did you see? I don't know why God would let me touch that little boy and him come through me or however how he came and hit that little boy. I don't feel like the right person. I feel underqualified. I feel, uh, I feel a lots of things. I feel understudied. I feel, I feel a lots of things. But it don't seem to bother the Holy Ghost how I feel. As long as I call on the name of Jesus in faith, as long as I believe that all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, <laughs> believing you shall receive. That's what I believe, okay? That's what the Bible says. Now you listen to me. I didn't know what to do next because his eyes came open and he looked at me and almost all the children are afraid of me. I'm big to them and they're little bitty and they run and scream and holler and all that stuff. This little boy was at such peace. I reached and got him. This is, listen, this is wonderful. <sighs> you picked this little live boy that was dead for a little over four and a half hours. And you remember what the Bible says three or four times, what Jesus always did with the children. He always brought them to their mother. And he most of the time said to them, give them something to eat. And so this is wonderful, okay? And so you take this baby, the, those warlocks and spiritist healers are now this way. Yeah. 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 Jesus.
Jesus. Jesus. Jesus. homework <laughs> sorry <laughs> brother my, I, that's not it has nothing to do look I, I'm, a, I'm a lifer I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Indian Hills jungle man you have to put up with some, some things about me okay but if you would do me a big favor Read this Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 13. Take those four, 13, 40, 50, 60, 70. Take those verses right there. I want you to take them home with you. I want you to meditate on them. I want you to become what they are by the time I see you tomorrow. Okay? I'm just going to read them to you, and then I want to pray with you. And I understand some of us have to go and that kind of thing. Would y'all please, no, just stay on your feet if you wouldn't mind, please. I've been on my feet for two hours. You can surely handle it for a few minutes. <laughs> I was able to take that little child. This is wonderful. <laughs> this is wonderful. And take that child over to the mother. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you, say? <laughs> you want to be right. You want to be right. You don't want to be wrong. Because oh. everything you do now is a precedent for what's going to happen in the future. Because there's no way now that the power of heaven's fallen and somebody's been raised from the dead. There's no way knowing who I am personally as an individual. You're not. This is the biggest momentum carrying rock power. This is going to go crazy now. So I'm thinking, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, what do I do? <laughs> so I'm going to take this baby over there. I laid it in the mother's arm, and she's just astounded like, like I am. I really wish I could be real spiritual with you. And I knew it was going to happen, brother and sister. But I would be lying through my teeth. Jesus came there because of the compassion for that lady. <laughs> and he helped me too. <laughs> I was so astounded that it worked. It really, really works. <laughs> It's wonderful. And here's what I told that lady. It's not a bad thing to say either if you ever get in this position. Ma'am, here's your son back from the dead by the power and the glory of the blood and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> It says right here in my Bible, and I'm going to pray if it's okay. And he goeth up into a mountain, and he called unto him whom he would. See, the thing is, now you're called. Uh-oh. And the second thing is that they came unto him. You have done that. Do you understand? Brother Hogan, you're, being, you're oversimplifying things. No, I'm not. This is what's happening. He called us apart. You have come apart. The second thing that's very valuable here is they went. You have. So have I. 
You started a journey with Jesus. It says right here in my Bible, it says, and he ordained them. That's what's taking place in your life. That's why you feel compelled and drawn and sent and, 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 and pushed out the way you feel. You're ordained of heaven. Okay? It says right here, and what were they ordained to do? See, this is, if I could leave anything with you, this is what I would leave with you, what I'm fixing to tell you right now. In my opinion, as a man that's been around the world several times, been in some of the greatest services that there ever will be, seen, I have personally been where 21 people have been raised from the dead. Listen to me. That's awesome. But it pales compared to your ability to be in his presence. <laughs> what do you ordain them to do first? To be with him. Do y'all see that? Is that what y'all's book says? Mine says that. So you got to break things down and look at it and understand and take your time. Don't rush. Don't, don't rush. Don't rush. Take your time a minute. First thing was you heard the call and second thing is you responded. Now you're obedient so far. But now... You've got to grab it. The most important thing you can ever do is spend time with Jesus. You won't glow if you don't sit at the feet of Jesus. <laughs> I may be the most simple man you've ever met, but you ain't never running anybody in our generation that has touched as many dead men and let them get up as I have. How does that feel? I don't like the way you dress. I don't care. I don't like the way you dress either. I don't like the way you talk. Ditto. But let me tell you something. Spending time with Jesus is numero uno. That's number one. Don't ever forget that. Because you get important. See, man, this thing's escalating around. I'm going into dozens of countries around the world. Oh, man, getting to speak at the greatest conferences. Ooh. You know what the highlight of my day today is? I enjoy being with you, but you know what the highlight of the day was for me? Waking up this morning, walking over to that window at that hotel, opening it up and saying, Sunshine, you caught me worshiping Jesus again. Me and the son have this little race to see who can get up first. <laughs> and it says right here, after, after they spent time with Jesus, then he sent them forth to preach. That's not first. That's second. You are valuable and you are important to the world but you are useless without the presence of Jesus. <laughs> useless. Don't go. Please. Don't humiliate yourself, the people who are sending you, without Jesus being with you. And the way you get him with you is you go to him. And then he'll send you to preach. And then there's something else he'll send you to do. It says... In verse 15, if you don't do it in this order, you're not going to be successful. It says right here, and it says, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and the fourth thing is to cast out devils. That's not first. That's last. Okay? In my opinion, in the devil's Listen for what I say. They do. They fear us. The most valuable thing you possess is the ability to seek Jesus. It's not how well you speak. It's not well, how well you pray. It's not how well you heal the sick. It's not how many demons you can cause to flee whenever you walk in. It's how well you know how to speak. 
I love you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. Absorb me, Jesus. Possess me, Jesus. <laughs> a couple of days ago, right before I drove over here, there was approximately seven new demons unleashed on me. Oh, it's, it's, I don't care how you take this, but it's invigorating, the new devils are. Keeps you alert. I respect my enemy, but I hate him. <laughs> my king is bigger than any demon they got. Hell does not have a devil big enough to stop God's power. Now, I want to ask you to do something. Would you lift your hands up to heaven with me? And I'm very cautious how I'm praying because I realize what can take place because of what's going on in our work and all of that. But I, I know that you people have been touched by heaven. I respect that this anointing with high respect the position I am standing here, God letting me speak to you. Uh, I am calculating every word. I'm doing everything I can to challenge your spirit. You need the fire of God. You need the fire of God. I need the fire of God. We together need the fire of God. Do you have somebody that can play a piano? Would you? Just for, just for a moment. I'm not going to pray for all these people. I'm just going to, we're just going to worship God. There's something we have to do. Is, is there somebody that's coming? Okay. Um, we need to thank Jesus for the blood that he shed. That's what we need to do. And I want you to know, if you open your heart up, you're making a big mistake. Because... He likes it when we worship him for his precious blood because it was pure and undefiled. It was our great atonement. It was our great redemption. It was perfect. <laughs> and the presence of Jesus is coming in this house right now. I'm telling you. I really can feel the power of heaven, and it's wonderful. I like to feel it. It feels good to me.